Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Adina Canefield, the CEO of NLI USA, and this is one of our NLI USA signature speaker series events, which I am absolutely delighted to bring to you um, and to celebrate Walt Whitman's birthday with all of you and to share the diversity of the library's holdings with you. I wanna take a moment to recognize the Lear Foundation, Henry and Erna Lear, who funded the digitization of the Whitman archives and of many of our archives at the National Library. I also want to thank my colleague, Naomi Schachter for being the inspiration behind this talk. And with that, I'm, I'm now ready to um, introduce to you, Dr. Fred Sugarman, who is a friend and a supporter of the National Library of Israel. Uh, he is the Associate Dean at Yeshiva College of Yeshiva University, where he has taught Walt Whitman for many years. He received his PhD in 19th century American literature from Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Sugarman taught at Bar Ilan University uh, in the 1980s, and he greatly misses Israel to this day. He's published a number of articles on American Jewish life as well. A New Yorker, Dr. Sugarman has enjoyed taking his students to the Brooklyn Bridge to read Walt Whitman's poem, Crossing the Brooklyn Ferry at the midpoint of the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> and now um, I'd like to introduce Def Dr. Stefan Litt, who is the curator of the Humanities Collection at the National Library of Israel and is an archival expert with the library. He's in charge of European language holdings. He received his PhD in pre-modern Jewish history from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Dr. Litt has published on the history of early modern European Jewry and on modern Jewish archival collections. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Stefan Litt about the National Library of Israel's Walt Whitman collections. And then Dr. Litt will invite Dr. Sugarman to share his insights on Walt Whitman with us. Dr. Litt. Yes. Hello everyone from Jerusalem and welcome to our event, which is uh, involving a number of uh, different continents as we usually do. And uh, that makes me always very happy. So uh, I have the privilege um, to tell you a bit about the collection that I came became familiar with a couple of years ago when I went through all our um, non-Hebrew language archival collections. And I was astonished to find uh, this particular one about Walt Whitman because I wouldn't have really expected to find something about this American poet who is to the best of my knowledge, not really connected to uh, the history of the land of Israel in any way. And um, then I learned a bit about the, the history of the collection. And um, that brings me also to our uh, cooperation uh, tonight with Yeshiva University, because uh, while um, making our exchange of opinions about the collections, we found out actually that both of our collections in Yeshiva University and at the, at the National Library, I'm sorry, um, were donated by a donor, Charles E. Feinberg from uh, Detroit in the US more than 50 years ago. And um, so there's a, a kind of double reason to talk jointly this evening about the collection. So please uh, allow me to bring to you my small presentation. I would like to uh, present a number of outstanding uh, pieces from our collection that we have. Um, first of all, uh, when all this happened, as I uh, mentioned before, it uh, was done in 1967-68 that Charles Feinberg uh, donated these materials to our holdings. He was um, very actively uh, doing so also uh, um, on the occasion of different collections. So it was not just about Walt Whitman, we have also some other small collections um, donated by him, so he was apparently an ardent collector. This collection, which is really not a big one, includes original photographs, proofs, programs, booklets, tickets, and also secondary materials about Walt Whitman and his uh, literary activities. 
All these materials have been digitized um, in the last couple of years with the generous support of the Lear Foundation that was mentioned already before. So you see this magnificent uh, portrait picture here on the left hand side, <clears throat> which is part of the collection and um, alongside a number of other items. So what struck me so um, deeply when I found this collection, well found when I discovered for me and for our online catalog this collection, is that um, Charles Feinberg made sure to be very, very cautious with the items he collected. You can see that he ordered apparently from a bookbinder these very special folders, which are um, high quality folders. And I've never seen something similar in our collection, except the other smaller collections he donated around the same time. And you see that he did not just donate it, he also donated it apparently honoring a friend uh, whose name was Jack Lipschitz in 1968. So um, we have this uh, piece here of paper and um, that's apparently a proof with some handwritten um, reviews by, by Walt Whitman and that made it worth, of course, to have this special folder produced for it. Here are some other items um, going back even to the days when Walt Whitman was still alive. There, was, um, uh, there were a number of events in um, um, Philadelphia as well in 1880 and 1886. You can see this uh, program, um, a lecture by Walt Whitman about Abraham Lincoln, which makes definitely sense if you keep in mind his probably most famous poem, and I'm sure we will hear about that. And here is also um, an entrance ticket to one of these events. Then we also have um, this sheet, which is, in, in my opinion, um, a kind of um, title page of this um, uh, anthology of poems by Whitman. And I've seen others on the internet with the same uh, signature. So I'm not really sure that this is an original signature. It might be a kind of um, facsimile that was produced for um, this edition of the books from 1881. And <clears throat> We have an entrance ticket to a birthday event that, which took place um, many, many years ago, but exactly on the same day, you see May 31 in 1889. And that was in Morgan's Hall in Camden, New Jersey, where Walt Whitman lived for the last years of his life. For the same event, we have also this program, um, which is a kind of shared uh, sheet. As you can see on the left-hand side, we have the um, food which was um, served the same evening and then the cultural um, flow on the right hand side. So um, I would like to mention also that we as do not have simply these original items which are great of course but um, there's also this sheet which is um, the Hebrew translation of um, the famous poem on uh, Abraham Lincoln by Naomi Shemer, the famous Israeli songwriter and composer. And she translated it by herself and also made a song out of it. And you can see that uh, she um, also did some reviews of the, of the uh, text that she wrote in her own handwriting. And that's of course uh, not part of the Walt Whitman collection, but it's part of Naomi Shemmer's personal archive kept in our music department. So um, this is really in a nutshell about the collection that we have and uh, which goes together as we understood just recently uh, with the uh, collection in Yeshiva University. And I'm definitely happy that we have the, the um, occasion to talk about this this evening. And thank you for your patience. And now the floor is yours, Fred. Dr. Stefan. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to briefly say, first of all, Adina's introduction uh, captured me. And the cheap way out would be to say, I have nothing left to say. Going to the middle of the Brooklyn Bridge with a class of students and reading Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, it's an experience all of you should share. It's um, remarkable. The poem Actually, today in New York City, they always um, honor Whitman's birthday by reading this poem at the foot of the Brooklyn Bridge. So maybe next year we'll try that, okay? Um, I just have to, first of all, say thank you to Stefan. Um, it's been a delight seeing the collection and 
then letting him know that Yeshiva University, thanks to Mr. Feinberg, also has a rather remarkable small collection, including uh, an original edition of the 1860 Weaves of Grass, which is um, quite, a, quite a piece to have. I have to thank Adina, Stefan, Sarah. I saw Sarah was on in Daron. Um, you guys are pros. Um, everyone in Israel should be proud of this library's administrative team. It's been a pleasure. Um, my dear friend, Naomi Schachter, virtual wave to Naomi. Um, during COVID, Naomi nudged this event along every year. Fred, when are you going to talk about Whitman? And every year we passed, and Naomi, here we are. So thank you. And finally, I just have to say, it's so touching to me that the Israel National Library of Israel is celebrating Whitman's birthday. Why? Because in America right now, um, we're starting to actually hear too many talks about banning books. Whitman in his lifetime in 1863 was fired from a job with the government because um, one of the senior people saw a copy of Leaves of Grass in his drawer and said, I won't employ anyone who has such filth, that he wrote such filth. But we're getting to a point where perhaps, sadly, Israel is going to be the beacon of literacy, of culture. And, uh, you know, guys, I applaud you. Anyway, onward and upward, let's talk a little about Whitman, which makes me very happy. I'm going to share the screen. Um, well, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I got it. Sorry, guys. Can everyone see this okay? Yes, great. Okay, um, a rendezvous with Walt Whitman in the National Library is the title created by the NLI staff. We love it, that's the title. Um, I purposely chose two pictures, one crossing Brooklyn Ferry on the left, a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge, even though crossing Brooklyn Ferry, of course, was written in 1856. The great Roebling masterpiece, which is the Brooklyn Bridge, happened in 1883, 82-83. But the point um, of this poem is that Brooklyn and Manhattan, this was the beginning of what I would call the empire. The rise, Brooklyn as a borough in 1830 had about 18,000 people. By the time Whitman wrote this poem, there were 200,000 people. It doesn't sound like an enormous amount, but the, the growth of Brooklyn was explosive. And the other thing about this bridge, besides its beauty, it is really the best bridge in New York, in my humble view. The other thing is the way it sits. It sits, it goes east-west, the view goes, I'm sorry, the view goes west-east. Behind you is the east, in front of you is the west. North is the right, left is the south. This is a bridge that places you exactly in the nexus that Whitman's poem, his philosophy, is leading to. The centrality of first the poet, but in Brooklyn Ferry, it'll be something else. The picture on the right is the famous 1855 Leaves of Grass. This is the picture of Walt Whitman. And as you know, this is kind of Jack Kerouac, the beats, the counterculture movements, when I was younger, the rock and roll movements of uh, the Grateful Dead, et cetera, et cetera. This was the image of the loafer, the bohemian. And one of the great problems of Walt Whitman is Walt Whitman was a failed journalist. He was a failed editor. He was a failed school teacher. Walt Whitman didn't particularly, except for a brief stint with the Brooklyn Eagle, which was a newspaper in 1846, 1848, Walt Whitman really had no status in the world. As, well as, you, as all of you know, he was also homosexual, which is a status in 1855, America could have only been so marginal, it's not even possible to imagine it. And he creates this picture of Walt Whitman, one of the roughs of cosmos. It's a total creation and part of the mystery and brilliance of Whitman is what he did. He kind of, the only, the only writer that, and I'll suggest to the audience, the only writer that I could conceive of doing this uh, was Charles Dickens. 
Dickens somehow started his career as a journalist. He wrote letters from Boz, which became the Pickwick Papers. And then he became Charles Dickens, which at the time he was alive was uh, akin to being a rock star, total rock star. Anyway, we're moving on the question of Whitman. How did we get to that picture? How did he become Whitman? And we'll look at Brooklyn Ferry was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, 1855, Whitman receives a letter from Emerson. And in the letter, he says, I greet you at the beginning of a great career, which yet must have had a long foreground somewhere for such a start. So what I ask everyone to consider is, what was Whitman's foreground? There was, as far as we know, no biographer has ever really been able to capture it, and no student of poetry has been able to capture it. But the great foreground of Whitman was something we really can't explain. The only way to really explain it is through American literature, and particularly through Emerson. Um, Emerson, in 1841, his collection of essays in Self-Reliance, writes the following. Life only avails not the having lived. Power ceases in the instant of repose. It resides in the moment of transition from a past to a new state, in the shooting of the gulf, in the darting to an aim. This one fact the world hates that the soul becomes. For that forever degrades the past, turns all riches to poverty, all reputation to shame, confounds the saint with the rogue, shoves Jesus and Judas equally aside, Remember, Emerson was ordained by the Harvard Divinity School. So when you look at that phrase, shoves Jesus and Judas equally aside, what was he doing? What, what was the aim of Emerson? Not a simple question, but what Emerson was engaged in, by the 19th century, 1835, when he starts becoming Emerson, religion in America, for all intents and purposes, has collapsed. The Puritan effort to create the city on the hill, and all of you should know the phrase city on the hill is always attributed to Ronald Reagan. No, no, no. It was John Winthrop on the letter to, you know, model of Christian charity when he arrived on the Arabella. And the notion was American exceptionalism. America was supposed to be the great beacon to the world. It was supposed to found a great religion, a great people. That had collapsed over 200 years and was no longer something people felt. So when Emerson and self-reliance says the soul becomes and shoves Jesus and Judas equally aside, what he was engaged in is what I would call the act of the imperial self. He was attempting at that point to tell people that the individual, the individual free of all constraints of what was known in society, is now the standard with which America is gonna go forward. I'll go on, when good is near you, when you have life in yourself, it is not by any known or custom way. You shall not discern the footprints of any others. You shall not see the face of a man. You shall not hear any name. The way, the thought, the good shall be wholly strange and new. It shall exclude example and experience. You take the way from man, Again, you have to take this very seriously. What Emerson is saying is you don't learn from other people. Famous quote of Emerson's was Plato was once a student in a library. Everyone is free. Everyone is compelled to start from their notion of who they are and what they are. All persons that ever existed are its forgotten ministers. Um, in place of God, becomes the eye, which there's a famous uh, caricature of Emerson's transparent eyeball, which once appeared in the New Yorker, which shows a stick man with an eyeball. But what Emerson is really getting at is this notion that it is the self freed of all these constraints that does become the imperial self. And then we move to Whitman, his student. And um, the connection between Emerson and Whitman, I think, is absolutely essential. If you come to Whitman's poetry without that background, you will not be able to get it. So 
1855, we have Walt Whitman springing onto the stage. He publishes, self-publishes 800 copies of Leaves of Grass, of which, by the way, 200 survive. So he basically doesn't sell any copies, but somehow, miraculously, a copy gets to Emerson, who's rapturous about it. He writes him that letter, and then Whitman is going to put it in the 1856 edition, but prior, he publishes this kind of flow of consciousness preface to explain what his poetry is about. And I subtitled this, Have You Felt So Proud to Get at the Meaning of Poems, which is a phrase that's kind of haunted me all the time about Whitman, because there is this notion that we as students of literature are supposed to be able to understand the meaning of a poem. Um, when I was in graduate school, there were famous books, the skeleton key to Ulysses, the skeleton key to the wasteland. And you would read them and would kind of give you a frame to hang the meaning of a poem about. Whitman in the 1855 Leaves of Grass preface is going to suggest something that's really, I would say, modernist. It's based on free association. And at the center of it is the poet as God. And I'll just read from this briefly. There will soon be no more priests. You see the similarity with Emerson, Judas and Jesus shoved aside. Their work is done. They may wait a while, perhaps a generation or two, dropping off by degrees. A superior breed shall take their place. The gangs of cosmos and prophets and mass shall take their place. So you have a displacement. At the center of the universe is the poet. And here's this man who has failed at everything he's done, positing that it's only the poet that could save us. The poet can make every word he speaks draw blood. Whatever stagnates in the flag of custom or obedience or legislation, he never stagnates. Obedience does not master him, he masters it. High up out of reach he stands, turning a concentrated light. He spreads out his dishes. He offers the sweet, firm, fibered meat that grows men and women. And then the final, I bolded, his brain is the ultimate brain. He is no arguer. He is judgment. He judges not as the judge judges, but as the sun falling about a helpless thing. That phrase should sink in for a few reasons. First of all, Whitman's connection with the sun. The sun, in Song of Myself, he's going to write, dazzling and tremendous, how quick the sunrise would kill me if I could not now and always send it out of me. So what you see is the notion that the outer world, the world of value, the world that we know as being the object world, when you take it in, if you in fact can send it back in some transfigured form, it would kill him. It would undo what he's doing. And the sun becomes an image. Where does it become an image? His greatest poem, the sundown poem. In 1856, Whitman published this, my own personal favorite, edition for all you Whitman fans is the 1860 edition, but that's of no matter. In 1856, he publishes the Sundown poem. It is a much more compact poem than the 52 section poem, which is Song of Myself, which is his incalculable masterpiece. This is a better poem in the technical sense. And here I am playing the game of being a literary critic and telling you this poem could be digested, it could be put into form. Um, this is Walt Whitman. You have to, I, I, I'm gonna tell you today in a few minutes what this poem might be about. I think it's about, but you know what? Happy birthday, Walt. It's gonna change for each of you. And that's precisely the greatness of Whitman who really, again, is one of the essential literary figures of the world. This view of the bridge that you see here is a much better view. As Adina said, right at mid-span at sunset, you know what, Adina, that's when you want to be there. That's when all the viewers want to be there because the whole movement of this poem 
works towards disintegration. It's a poem of extraordinary movement. We're going to get into it in two minutes. Um, but the poem moves. It's a harbor. It's a harbor of boats going back and forth. It's a harbor of people. It's a harbor of birds. It's a harbor of water. It's extraordinary what's in this poem in terms of motion. There is no end in what we see, you know, the light, the, the, this and that. It's nine sections. And forgive me, Walt, what I've done is I've tried to title them a little bit. I've done a skeleton key for the sundown or crossing Brooklyn Ferry. But you have the opening or the proem, as I'll call it, the look at others, the 12th month seagull, one of the wonderful images of all of poetry, disintegration, repentance, the poet leaves you, the teacher is destroyed, and then the resurrection of the new. Um, this is deep prophetic stuff. So if I sound a little bit like a madman, please don't call Hatsola or EMS. I think I'm still in my senses. Let's move on to the poem. Okay, have some fun. The poem starts, flood tide below me. I see you face to face. Clouds of the west, sun there half an hour high. I see you also face to face. Crowds of men and women attired in the usual costumes. How curious you are to me. On the ferry boats, the hundreds and hundreds that cross returning home are more curious to me than you suppose. And you that shall cross from shore to shore years hence are more to me and more in my meditations than you might suppose. You're all good students of literature. What you should pick up almost immediately is flood tide below me, right away. Flood tide, high tide, the, at the time of the most movement. But also water is a symbol. Water is a symbol. It could be a flood, but it's also of fecundity, of growth, of all these things. And this is a time of growth. But better yet, what Whitman is always going to do in his great poems is use pronouns. I see you. It's about the poet and the reader. He's seeing you and he's seeing you. You know, if you've stood up on a bridge and looked in the water, it's extraordinary. You get multiple layers of views, um, the water, the sky. I see you face to face. That's the essential Whitman. The I is gonna become the you, you're gonna take over, you're gonna move on to the bridge. And what you're gonna see, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to lower Manhattan, which by the way, for you American Lit fans, what great American novel starts in lower Manhattan? Of course, Moby Dick. Water and meditation are wedded forever. You know, Ishmael also, this is not a surprise. 1851, Ishmael takes that walk, he winds up looking in the water. I see you face to face, clouds of the west, sun half an hour high, I see you also face to face, look at the optics. He's going west, he's looking in the distance, out to California even. Sun's only half an hour high, I see you face to face, crowds of men and women, if you come to New York and you take the Manhattan, you know, the Staten Island Ferry or any of the ferries, what you're struck by, and this is the point of this poem, I'm watching that scene, Walt Whitman watched that scene in 1855. It's transferable. It's timeless. He's anchored us in a site that it really does give you a sense of time crossing. And then this notion, curious is the word that's most interesting in these opening. What is curious about them? They're women, they're men, they're children. Why are they curious? And, and more in my meditations than you might suppose. One last thing, I is I, the Emersonian transparent eyeball, the I, the center, you. Here we go to the 12th month seagull, which appears, you know, some lines down in the poem. And if you watch the optics as I read this, keep your mind on the changing of the seasons, but this is gonna move. I too many and many a time crossed the river of old, watched the 12th month seagull, saw them high in the air floating with motionless wings, oscillating their bodies, saw how the glistening yellow lit up parts of their bodies and left the rest in strong shadow. 
saw the slow wheeling circles and the gradual edging towards the south, saw the reflections in the summer sky, had my eyes dazzled by the shimmering tracks of beams, looked at the fine centrifugal spokes of light round the shape of my head in the sunlit water, looked on the haze on the hills southward and southwest, looked on the vapor as it flew in fleeces tinged with violet. The seagull starts out as a December bird. We're moving towards the equinox. We're going from the 12th month seagull. But yet, after it goes wheeling, after it goes oscillating, and where does it wind up? Edging towards the south, saw the reflection of the summer sky. This is optics that only a great artist can do. Capture that one image of the bird, of us as readers watching as he unfolds this conversion experience, really, because once again, what Whitman's suggesting is you, me, Fred Sugarman, who goes down to the Brooklyn Bridge and watches, is watching a pageant. The pageant is not of the moment. The pageant is moving in greater circles. The images are suggesting larger pathways. And what they're suggesting larger pathways, it remains to be seen. Also, the vapor as it flows in fleeces is something he's going to come back to. Disintegration. Whitman is the great poet of uncreation. It's, it's a striking thing to say about it because one of the features of the, the great Whitman poem, Song of the Open Road, Song of Myself, um, the Lilac poem, um, you know, the Song of Occupations, um, Song of Myself, I said, is what I call the Whitman catalog, where I, I, I have to admit when I teach Whitman, I tend to get bored with the catalogs, but I realize why I'm wrong. Because what Whitman is doing is he's constituting an alternate world. He'll say, I see this, I see that. At a certain point though, before he could constitute what he wants you to see as an alternate world, he has to disintegrate. And in the underlying phrase, which is giving critics so much trouble, and us as readers so much trouble, is I too had been struck from the float, forever held in solution. The solution is the flood tide, but the solution is also the baby in a womb. I, I mean, I'm being obvious, and this is what literary critics tend to do sometimes. So forgive me for that. But it's the, the solution, the float forever held in solution. What's happening here is Whitman is positing this question between us. It's no longer you and I, I and you. He's brought us into his realm. What is it between us? What is the count of the scores of hundreds of years between us? We're now, oh, what are we now? We're, three, uh, we're 250 years away from his first vision. It's amazing. That's where we are. We're with Whitman. Whatever it avails not, distance avails not, place avails not. I, too, the I is back, lived. Brooklyn of Ample Hills was mine. I, too, walked the streets of Manhattan, etc. I, too, felt curious about the abrupt questioning stir within me. In the day among crowds of people, sometimes they came up upon me in my walks home, as I lay at night, as I lay in my bed, they came upon me. Now, again, this is where critics would obviously cite Whitman's homosexuality, the famous, let's say, 28 bather scene in Song of Myself. But, it, you know, again, I, I always find, not only because I'm at a wonderful school like Yeshiva University, and I don't want to necessarily move too quickly into areas that might not you know, be comfortable for people, really. Um, what I also find is that the homosexuality of Whitman is not that interesting to me. It's a bigger topic. It's something all of us have had. Sometimes at night, you start wondering and it starts breaking down what you think, uh, certainly in the last years of COVID, I know all of us have, and you start thinking down, it starts breaking down this kind of dream state which Whitman's extraordinary at. Um, and then he goes to, I too had been struck from the float. I too received identity by my body. He's the great poet 
of physicality. No one is as great a poet of the physical as Whitman that I was, I knew was of my body and what I should be, I knew should be of my body. So this section moves to kind of an understanding that we have to leave this notion of I and you and we have to merge. And how do we do that? Well, this is, I, I'm always amazed by this section because it reminds me obviously of Yom Kippur because this is um, the all hate section. This is the section, but look what Whitman does with it. This is repentance. He brings us in and then what he says is look, He's not the poet of Song of Myself who says he's a god, or he's not the Emerson who says he's the arbitrator of what's the soul. What he is here, he's one of us. I am he who knew what it was to be evil. I too knitted the old knot of contrariety. Now, um, famous moment, I'm sorry to back off in, uh, into this. Very early in Song of Myself, one of the phrases I truly remember and love in Whitman, He's in a room and he uses the phrase, trippers and askers surround me. Trippers and askers surround me. Who was your mother? What was your early life? Um, in Jewish communities, I call it the Jewish geography moment, where someone's actually trying to place you and find out who you are. I too knitted the old knot of contrariety. Blab, blush, resented, lied, stole, grudge, had a guile, anger, lust. Hot wishes I dared not speak was wayward, vain, greedy, shallow. It's quite a list. It's quite a list. And he goes on the cheating look. But this is something that when Jews gather and do this um, on Yom Kippur, you're seeking repentance and accepting, I assume, I'm not coming in my rabbinic guards, garb, but you're accepting the notion of God's kingship and your service and that you've erred in so many ways, but you're returning to be better. In this, Whitman is not asking you to return to God. He's asking you to return to a new self. And that is really something that we haven't caught up with. And that's what I'm calling is the teacher is destroyed. Um, Whitman's gonna say in Song of Myself, he who learns best learns how to destroy the teacher. The teacher is destroyed. This is a line from Whitman, which um, God bless PowerPoint gave me this rather strange layout, but I hope you like it. We understand that, do we not? What I promise without mentioning it, have you not accepted? What study could not teach was it what the preaching could not accomplish is accomplished, is it not? So this is the implicit thing. I don't really, as Walt Whitman, have to work on you anymore. You've taken this journey with me. You've understood you have to be free of these bounds that determine who you are, who you are, you know, how your physical nature is determined, how your mental nature. I know this sounds impossible, but it goes so far in Emerson as Whitman to say that at a point, if you heard your mother and father actually calling you and asking you to do something, but your muse said, you shouldn't, you walk away. This is the extreme radicalism of American thought. And I just wanna suggest one thing. If you read Moby Dick, Melville was well aware of that, because Ahab is Walt Whitman, is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Now we move to the resurrection of the new. You have waited, we've waited, we're you. You always wait, you dumb, beautiful ministers. Funny phrase, dumb and beautiful. We receive you with free sense at last and are insatiate. We're not satisfied, you're hungry, henceforward. Not you anymore shall be able to foil us or will hold yourself from us. We use you and do not cast you aside. We plant you permanently within us. We fathom you not, we love you. There is perfection in you also. You furnish your parts toward, towards eternity. Great or small, you furnish your parts towards the soul. That Emerson word. Um, extraordinary ending, extraordinary last, mo uh, last movement of this poem. But what I would say is you dumb, beautiful ministers, I didn't print this out for you, but in Song of Myself, he has something eerily similar to this. Through me, many long dumb voices, voices of the interminable generation of prisoners and slaves, 
voices of the diseased and despairing, and of the threads that connect the stars, and of the wombs and father stuff, of the deformed, trivial, flat, foolish, despised, fog in the air, beetles rolling balls of dung, long dumb voices. You see the whip, you know, and I'll just um, really finish with a couple of just very quick thoughts. Um, the Whitman program is an extraordinarily radical program. Um, you have Walt Whitman, a man again, who is an itinerant failure and somehow magically through whatever, it wasn't just Emerson, there were many other things, but we will never fathom it. But somehow Walt Whitman determined the poet was gonna save America, America was gonna be the greatest poem and finally, Walt Whitman was going to give poetic voice to this whole American project. Um, on his birthday, um, you know, this is not a bracha, but on his birthday, what I absolutely have to suggest is that Whitman is the person that we can't do without. He's the poet. He is the one that when we read, somehow we feel better thinking that there actually is hope for America that American exceptionalism is somehow real, but yet it's at the cost of trying to forget about the askers and trippers. How we achieve that program? I don't know, the last line of Song of Myself says, I stopped somewhere waiting for you. So perhaps at this moment, we could stop somewhere waiting for all of you to either ask questions or go home and read so, uh, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry on his birthday. Anyway, thank you so much. And if I sounded like I was disintegrating, thank you, Walt Whitman. All right. So do you want to pull your... Great. So thank you for that insight and uh, for helping us all parse a poem and, and, and and remind ourselves of, of, of the layers um, that these poems reveal. I think for those of us in New York and um, travel across the Brooklyn Bridge very often, it continues to be magical. Yesterday was Manhattan Hedge in New York where people were out in the streets looking at sunsets. Um, and I can only imagine those that got to see the sunset uh, from the Brooklyn Bridge yesterday, which is supposed to be one of the most beautiful days to see a sunset in, in Manhattan. Um, with that, I want to open it up to questions. Um, uh, and I am going to start with a question that, that your friend Naomi Schachter um, posed uh, to you, Fred. And uh, Naomi commented that, um, we're curious if, if Whitman ever made it uh, to Israel. Did he travel a lot? And um, of course, um, we know that Mel oh. Bill spent time in Israel, and we wanted you to talk about his travels, and in particular, uh, whether he made it to Israel or not. Well, no, uh, naturally, first of all, hi, Naomi, and it is a great question. Um, the, the good answer to it is, of course, no, as Dr. Litz said. We know and, you know, finding a reference to, quote, Palestine, it wouldn't be Israel. Um, I don't know of any in Whitman. Um, the only interesting thing I could posit briefly for the group, of course, is um, my dissertation topic, Herman Melville, famously came to Israel in Jerusalem and wrote a fairly unreadable 600-page poem called Clarol. And um, Melville was probably suicidal when he came to Israel, so he didn't like it very much. I'm sorry about that, but you know, Naomi, um, Whitman connection with Israel was, um, that's why it's fascinating what the library has as holdings and fascinating that you're doing this birthday party with him because Whitman was not attached to Israel in any literary way we know about. Um. Stefan, I wonder if you could comment on um, on Fred's most recent comment about why the library has this kind of a holding. You and I have had many conversations about the humanities collection and its role at the library. Um, and perhaps you could shed light on um, going back historically to the founding of the library and, and the concept of the library of, of uh, the Jewish people of the land of Israel 
Palestine at the time and, and, and the, the place of the humanities collection at the library. Yeah, of course. Well, that's a very long story. And I should mention maybe that our institution is celebrating also a kind of birthday this year um, as we um, consider ourselves to be alive for 130 years now. And that makes us, to the best of my knowledge, to one of, if not the oldest uh, cultural institutions in, in Israel or before pre-state uh, Palestine, of course. And uh, <clears throat> the library uh, was found as, as a small public Jewish library in, um, in the western part of, the, of, the, of modern Jerusalem, of course, it was outside the old city. But uh, since 1920, there were clear um, plans to um, have it merged together with the newly founded Hebrew University, which was a, um, a university from scratch, um, which had no previous collections or institutions or whatsoever. So it was most natural to combine both institutions and to make the library also uh, the, the Jewish National and University Library. And uh, in that function, <clears throat> it was, of course, very, very crucial not just to have a, a good Jewish collection, but also a collection that goes beyond these borders and uh, makes it to a um, yeah, first uh, quality place in, in Palestine then and today in the state of Israel for humanities in the widest sense. Of course, there's a very strong focus on on the so-called national collections, which are the Judaica collection and the collection about Israel and uh, its history and cultural history. But beyond that, we have also a very good Islam and Middle East collection. And um, also, um, let's call it all the rest, which is a general humanities. And I think that makes it so, so important. Um, especially for the situation here in Israel to be on the kind of cultural borderline between East and West to have also uh, materials representing Western culture and not just uh, Jewish, pure Jewish Israeli culture or uh, Oriental so-called Israeli culture, whatever that means. And <clears throat> I think th that's um, happening in most of, of uh, big libraries, whether they are university libraries, academic libraries or national libraries, whenever they got offered, a very special piece um, for their collection, which actually do not relate 100% to the to the collection policy, you cannot withstand. And uh, I think that's also the point with with Walt Whitman. And uh, I'm absolutely sure that maybe even more in the 1960s, there were so many people in and around Jerusalem, and uh, in particular <clears throat> among the, the library staff, who had a clear understanding why um, Walt Whitman original items are crucial for any collection and you shall never say no to such an offer. And I would just like to mention that I saw on the chat one of the first remarks was some um, um, nice remark from a nephew, if I've seen correctly, from uh, Charles Feinberg, who said that he knew him, of course, and he remembers all his donations to uh, several institutions. I'm, I'm really happy that the circle closed uh, with this remark and um, so we are um, still very much aware about this collection and uh, as you can see we are even using it for a birthday party. Now let me, um, I saw in the chat that one of Mr. Feinberg's nephews is watching, so that's nice. I'm sorry, just a little point. Great, so Professor Price um, commented that the words of, uh, of Whitman just seem so natural and seem to flow and fall off the page so easily and beautifully. And we wanted to get a little insight from you on, uh, you know, did Whitman labor at his poetry? What was, you know, what, what was it to him? How easy was this for him? Always, always glad for a question from the good professor. <laughs> and I'm also afraid to answer. If I answer wrong, I'll be in trouble. But anyway, no, it, uh, of course he labored. It was, um, you know, and um, an answer um, to Professor Price one, yes, Whitman kept voluminous notebooks. And even before the 1855, he walked around New York City, Brooklyn with notebooks, which he, you know, would scribble in, would keep notations in. Um, you know, and you know what Jonathan's asking, what to me, maybe I'm answering it wrong, but what the heck? 
Um, the most interesting thing is Whitman's lifelong devotion to the notion that Leaves of Grass was an ongoing notebook, right? If everyone you know understands what I'm saying, you have 1855, 6, 60, um, 65, I think the night lose track, 72. He published eight or nine editions of it. So he always saw it as a work in progress. And, um, and did he labor mightily? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, again, I'm, Melville is my port of call with scholarship, but um, if someone who really is deeply involved with Whitman would be able to speak more to the various editions and the changes. I just tell the people watching who have been so kind to watch, um, order the 1860 edition. It's my personal favorite. Okay. Great. So um, someone from the audience wanted to know about how Whitman is received at, at YU. How oh. what, what it's like. I could get myself in big trouble with Dr. Rabbi Ari Berman, but I won't. Um, no, it's fascinating. You know, again, um, you know, Adina, it's such a good question and to answer it. I mean, first of all, any good teacher and any good instructor, good professor tries not to overlay their conceptions of a writer on students, right? You try and put the work out there, discuss that, give them the tools so they could come to understand that what I what I found at YU, which was remarkable, is I taught I'm teaching the course again in the fall, thankfully, um, is students' openness to Whitman has been extraordinary. Now I don't know if that's a compliment to um, you know the kind of students we have or Jews in general, but um, I or maybe it's just the way I tread on the subject matter. But I don't need to give brownie points to anyone in particular. Um, you know, the questioner who asked, I mean, um, they've received Whitman and what's so nice for a teacher is years later, I'll meet a student, they'll say, I'm still reading Whitman because you taught it. That to me is the highest compliment. And I think they've, I don't remember any student walking away saying this is garbage, this is nonsense, I'm offended by it or anything of that sort. There's a question about Whitman's homosexuality ah. and, and its influence on his writing, and um, there, you know, there were apparently questions about whether or not he was indeed a homosexual. And this person wanted to know if, if you believe it's actually definitive that his writings do reflect that part of his, his being. Uh, I, you know, again, I, what I was really trying to say—it's funny, I. Where can I give you an example of another writer? Um, you know, like Shakespeare. Let's go to the big guy, the big one. Um, so there are a lot of critics who read Shakespeare in terms of was he a Christian or a Protestant, right? Because that was a huge point. His father may have been a closet Christian. Shakespeare himself may have been. So that's the way they read certain moments in the plays. Um, I don't find that that interesting. I, I think the work of art the work of art, trying to peek in the corners and trying to find, was Whitman a homosexual? Sure. Um, do I have definitive proof? Well, you read it. For example, anyone who reads section seven of Song of Myself, um, you know, fred.sugarman at yu.edu email me and tell me I'm wrong. Of course, it, there's no doubt that he was homeless. Pete Doyle, the, the trolley car driver who lived with him for years, um, when he lived, believe it or not, the great American poet died in Camden, New Jersey, and Nickel Street in a, you know, kind of two-story walk-up house. Um, he was. Um, did it affect his writing? Of course it had to, but I'm, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not that interested in decoding sections um, like the one we read in um, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry where Whitman talks about at night, the questionings or doubt, were these questionings about his sexuality? Yeah, maybe, maybe they were, they probably were, they could be. Does it give us any further insight into those lines that we wouldn't have if we're any other kind of orientation sexually? No, they're, they're the kind of doubts you have at 3 a.m. in the morning when you wake up and get a bowl of cereal and start watching bad TV. Sorry about that line, guys. <laughs> anyway. 
um, interesting question here, an observa observation from Ellie Sachs, who is seeing a connection between um, Whitman's search for his successor um, and, and the connection between um, the laying on of hands between Moses and, and Joshua. And oh. um, you can comment on that. You know, here's what I propose next year, bring back a scholar of the prophets, the Jewish prophets, and let them talk about Whitman and Jeremiah. I, as, as Naomi and Jonathan know, my Hebrew is not good. So I won't, but there's a lot, you know, the specific thing you're asking, the laying on of hands, I, I think there are extraordinary connections. And I think Whitman probably learned a lot from like most 19th century writer, what we would call the King James Bible. And I think particularly um, there's been a lot of scholarship done. Uh, maybe Professor Price is on knows it. Um, between particularly Jeremiah, the line, the poetry of Jeremiah and Whitman. And I think there's absolute an article or more in that or a presentation that I would love to hear. But I'll pass Adina totally. You know, I'm, my Hebrew's not up to it. My, my uh, Jewish knowledge may not be up to it. I'm sorry. All right. Um, with that, I... Um want to just conclude and thank you both for this incredible and unique opportunity to both understand the library and its holdings, um, the vastness of the library and um, its connection to one of the great American poets of our day, um, of our time, of our history. And um, to have you, Dr. Sugarman, shed light on that and take us on a really special uh, moment to um, just enjoy literature, enjoy poetry and, and think creatively. And Dr. Litt, always um, a pleasure to learn from you. And uh, we thank you both very, very much. It was a and treat. Happy birthday, everyone. Happy birthday, Walt Whitman. Have a good day. Have a good night. <laughs>